Hi everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. We're continuing with Unit 1, DNA in the Genome, and we're going to move on to Key Area 2, which is replication of DNA. So, last time we looked at Key Area 1, we looked at the structure of DNA, we looked at the bonds that hold the DNA double helix together, and we also looked at the three prime and five prime ends of DNA, and that's going to be quite useful in this part now. So to continue on with the replication of DNA, you might remember from National 5 that in mitosis, there's a term at the start of mitosis that just says that DNA is duplicated or DNA is replicated. And then we go on to producing two new daughter cells. What we're going into in higher is a bit more detail on how DNA actually replicates. And that is how a double helix of DNA makes an exact copy of itself. So let's look at this. Essentially what happens in DNA replication is there's three stages. You start off with the original strand of DNA. We're then going to split this and the weak hydrogen bonds are going to break between them. The new bases of DNA are going to be added to each strand to make another strand of DNA. To go into a bit more detail here, we're talking again about these hydrogen bonds that hold the bases together, the complementary base pairs in a DNA double helix. During the process of DNA replication, the DNA unwinds and those weak hydrogen bonds break between them. So this allows the two strands to now unzip into two template strands. And this is something that we call a Y-shaped replication fork, basically where DNA replication is about to take place. There's two main terms that we're going to be looking at during the process of DNA replication. You might remember from key area one, we looked at the, front, uh, the three prime end of DNA and the five prime end of DNA. And you might remember that DNA can only be added to the three prime end. So if you look at this diagram in the middle, you can see you have a three prime end and you've now got this one strand of DNA because the weak hydrogen bonds have been broken between them. This strand we're going to call the leading strand. And it's the leading strand because the complementary DNA nucleotides can be added continuously to this three prime end to make a new strand of DNA. It goes up it just continuously, almost like a zipper going up a jacket. The other strand of DNA though, the five prime end, is going to be called the lagging strand. So we think lagging means it's kind of, it's fallen behind a little bit. It's not as simple as the three prime leading strand process. This is not a continuous zip. What happens here is that complementary DNA nucleotides make fragments of DNA. So individual fragments are joined together on the five prime end in order to make a new strand. But we'll go into more detail of this in a minute. So when we look at the formation of this three prime leading strand, first of all, we're going to have a couple of new words here. First of all, one is primers. So primers are short complementary sequences of nucleotides that are required at the start of a new DNA strand. So whenever DNA replication is starting to take place, you have this three prime end of the DNA strand and a primer is added to it to begin the process. As I've said here, this can only bind to the three prime end to begin this new process of making the complementary strand. When I talk about complex strands, hopefully you remember that you have complementary base pairs. So for example, C matches with G, A matches with T. Try and remember those because that can come up as well. So these complementary nucleotides that match with the DNA base pairs they get added through an enzyme, and this enzyme is called DNA polymerase. So this adds the complementary nucleotides onto this new strand, and this starts a complementary strand from the new 5' prime to 3' prime end. So you have the original DNA strand at the 3' prime end, the primer comes across and starts adding the complementary nucleotides, and that zips all the way up to create this new strand. As I said, the lagging strand is a bit more complicated. You need several primers at this replication fork while the DNA unwinds. And again, DNA polymerase still does the same job. It adds three complementary nucleotides that are in the area that get added to this strand, but it's added in fragments. So it's not the nice continual line. It's at the three prime end, adding in fragments, and they are joined together by another enzyme. This enzyme is called ligase, and it works a bit like, a, a bit like glue. So you have these different fragments of complementary nucleotides. They're all joined together in a sort of discontinuous strand, so not just one long strand that's working all the way up. These fragments are joined together by ligase to make an new strand. Another part to be aware of is this doesn't happen just at the end of one part of DNA and works all the way up. This is something that's continuously happening during DNA replication. 
To make sure the whole chromosome is replicated quickly and efficiently, there's lots of different replication forks going on throughout the DNA strand. So every single DNA molecule is composed of one original strand and one of the new strands, but there are several replication, for replication forks which are working at the same time throughout it. This slide here just gives you an overview of the requirements and the function of everything from DNA replication. In case you're asked in the exam what is required for DNA replication to take place. So obviously you have your original DNA template and we're going to be adding some free DNA nucleotides to make the new complementary strands. We've already came across primers, so you need your primers in order to start the process of DNA replication. And we've got a couple of enzymes that have been added. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that adds the free nucleotides to make a new complementary strand, or the fragments that make a new complementary strand. And on those lagging strands, you have another enzyme, ligase, which is that glue that I've spoke about that joins the DNA fragments together. Finally, something you need is ATP, because throughout the process of DNA replication, energy is required for it as well. So try and remember that ATP is also required for DNA replication. The last part of this key area is called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And this is effectively the same thing as DNA replication, but it's been done in a laboratory environment. So PCR is a technique used to create many copies of a fragment of DNA in a lab setting. And we also call this amplification of DNA, meaning that you make a large quantity of DNA. We'll look at uses of this shortly, but if you imagine that you were using a strand of DNA for forensics, for example, or some sort of medical testing, if you only have one and you test on it, then it's been used up. What you want to do in a lab setting is amplify or make a large amount of DNA so you can do lots of different tests with it. And this is what PCR is all about. So to start off with, again, in the form of DNA replication, uh, original DNA template strand is required. So in this case, this would be the DNA that you want to amplify, that you want to have lots of different copies of. In the first step of PCR, we use a machine called a thermocycler. What happens is the DNA sample that you have is heated to between 92 and 98 degrees Celsius. What this does is this breaks those weak hydrogen bonds that connect the complementary base pairs from the DNA double helix. So these DNA strands are now unzipped, they're broken apart. In the second part of polymerase chain reaction, the DNA sample is now cooled, so you don't want it as hot anymore to break those bonds. The two strands are then cooled to 50 to 65 degrees Celsius, and this allows these primers to bond to the separated DNA strands. So as we saw from DNA replication previously, these uh, primers, which are your short, short strands of DNA, they attach and com come across to the three prime end of the DNA strands. And in step three, the DNA sample is heated again. So it goes up to 70 to 80 degrees Celsius to allow DNA polymerase to bring these complementary uh, nucleotides to the free prime ends, just like we've seen again in DNA replication. The one bit that's important to note here though is this DNA polymerase enzyme is heat tolerant. Okay, it's quite hot at this stage. You want to have DNA polymerase that can handle that temperature. So again, the DNA polymerase takes nucleotides and adds complementary nucleotides to the three prime end of the original strands to make up new strands. This diagram here sort of shows you the, this round of PCR again as well because they talk about the temperature quite a lot and you could be asked about it in the exam. So again, if you look at step one here, you can see that the heating has taken place, temperatures went up and those hydrogen bonds have broken. In step two, there's been a bit of a round of cooling taking place and that's when the primers are added. In step three, the temperature starts to increase again. So we're heating and that heat resistant DNA polymerase has been added. These new strands are being produced. And finally, we'll look at step four, where basically the first round of DNA replication has ended. So we've now got a new replication of DNA taking place. So at the end of this first cycle, you now have two identical strands or molecules of DNA from the one that you had. Now, you might be wanting more than those though, so the cycle is going to repeat until you have the number of DNA molecules that you want. So for example, if you look at the table here, you can continue to double the copies of DNA you have through every cycle of PCR in order to have as many as you want. As I said earlier on, the machine that you use to carry out this process is called a thermocycler, essentially just a machine that goes through cycles of different temperatures throughout PCR. 
This automatically counts out repeated cycles of PCR, and eventually you can create millions of copies of a certain piece of DNA that you want within a few hours. So it's incredibly useful in a lab setting. One thing you should be aware of as well is what you would actually want to use this for. So I spoke about it a little bit earlier on. So for example, for forensics, you can have small quantities of DNA from something such as a crime scene, and you can amplify this so you can use the DNA and have lots of copies of DNA to determine who was there. At a similar level, you can use the DNA for paternity testing to find out who is the parent or if you're related to another individual. And finally, we're using PCR quite a lot through diagnosis, so through medical tests now. We can have embryonic DNA samples. You could check, for example, genetic disorders before birth. The last part we're going to look at here is the requirements of PCR. So it's quite similar to the requirements of DNA replication, but because this is a lab environment, there's other things that you need to add. So again, you have your original DNA template strand for the copying to take place. You need to have primers that will target the fragment of DNA and begin the process. You need your supply of nucleotides. It says here four types, so you've got four bases of DNA that are required. One of the things we do add to PCR is a pH buffer, and what that does is it makes sure that the optimum pH is always there throughout the process of PCR. And as we spoke before, you that heat-tolerant DNA polymerase. So that enzyme is going to be used to synthesize the new strand of DNA, and the whole process takes place within a thermocycler or a thermal cycler machine. So that's all you need to know for replication of DNA. In the two forms, you've got your constant replication of DNA, but you also have your polymerase chain reaction and the uses of it. So that kind of continues off the back of uh, the structure of DNA, and we'll use this to move forward onto key area three. Thanks so much for listening, folks, and I'll get the new one up as soon as possible. Thank you.